It is critical for quality and validation professionals to stay on the pulse of emerging policies and regulations from the FDA's computer software assurance draft to the newly released EU medical device general safety and performance guidance, evolving regulations are a constant. Our network of professionals cover these topics and more in print, in person and online, bringing the latest industry news and tools to our audience of hardworking experts just like you. The IVT network gives you the tools you need to succeed in your profession, providing innovative content, industry research, lifelong learning and opportunities for networking on a global level. For our listeners, receive 15 months for the price of 12 plus an exclusive discount with your new subscription. Subscribe today with IVT Network, the best decision you'll make all year for your life sciences career. This is Voices in Validation, brought to you by IVT Network. IVT Network is your expert source for life science regulatory knowledge. Voices in Validation brings you the best in validation and compliance topics. We interview industry experts from pharma, biotech, med devices, and laboratories. Here is the host of Voices in Validation, Stacy. Thank you and welcome to Risks Revolution, a monthly series of the Voices in Validation brought to you by the IVT Network. The goal of this series is to advance the maturity of risk management practices within the industry by covering topics that challenge quality professionals to seek opportunities to improve and advance the ways in which they perceive and manage risk. This week, co-host Lori is on vacation and Nula will hold down the fort and speak with guest Marty Lippa as they chat about risk knowledge infinity cycle as well as the ways risk management and risk and knowledge management work together to provide a more effective quality management system, ultimately protecting the safety of our patients. So welcome to Marty and Nula. Uh, Thank you very much. Hi, Stacey. Um, As always, great to be back. Um, And yeah, we're holding the fort without Laurie today. Um, But um, I am really looking forward to exploring this uh, risk knowledge infinity cycle, or as we've termed it, the LIPA loop, um, (laughs) uh, uh, where we've started calling it that. And and, you know, when we last met in our last episode, we explored with um, Amanda uh, McFarland how to move our organizations from dreading the risk process to living the risk life. And we discussed a lot of techniques and approaches um, in getting our people at all levels of the organization to embrace and embed the management of risk into their daily work flows. And today, you know, we're going to talk about that relationship um, between the twin or dual enablers um, for an effective quality risk management system. And a lot of what we're going to talk about is how do we tactically get this into the workflows? And of course, that is how do we get this marriage between um, QRM and, and KM, which up until now has largely been separated within the industry. But luckily, Marty's here um, and his work shows just how critical it is that these enablers should be integrated and working together. And just for full disclosure, um, I should acknowledge that I was one of um, Marty's supervisors at TU Dublin for his PhD, which he successfully defended um, at his final Viva in June. So congratulations, Marty. We're looking forward to seeing you in your cap and gown. Um, So um, uh, what about you, Marty? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Stacey and, and, and Nula. I'm uh, thrilled to be here today. I'm a fan of this uh, series. I've uh, learned a lot from it, and I, I agree with you, and we'll, we'll certainly cover that in terms of the opportunity to better integrate risk management and knowledge management. I'm anxious to share some of my perspectives and would love to hear any feedback. Fantastic. Well, it's great to have you here today, Marty, as Nula mentioned. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, And to do that, we're going to set the stage regarding ICHQ10, Pharmaceutical Quality System, which describes a model for building an effective PQS. And the diagram many of us are familiar with showcases the product life cycle from development to discontinuation, uh, showcasing QRM and KM, or knowledge management, at the bottom, going end-to-end and acting as enablers, as Nula alluded to. So the question for Marty to get us started with is based on this diagram and the introduction of ICHQ10 in 2009, why did QRM and KM end up as separate processes in the industry? So that's a great question, right? And I think that's, uh, and, and actually I did uh, investigate that a little bit. And before I answer that, um, let me give a couple of uh, data points. So. 
Uh, as you alluded to, of course, Stacey, the uh, Q10 definition of a pharmaceutical quality system um, positions QRM and KM as dual enablers, co-enablers. Uh, and um, that so hopefully you're all familiar, quite familiar with that. Um, and based on some of the research that I had done, I had the opportunity to explore that. And I, I did several surveys and one of them evaluated um, the linkage between QRM and KM. And when asking the question, if people believe they should be related in theory, um, that i.e. that Q10 uh, sets them up to be related, 97%, an overwhelming 97% believe that they are highly independent. So there's pretty much unanimous uh, alignment on that. However, when asked the same question about how integrated they are in practice, in practical terms, only 5% believe they were fully integrated. So quite the, quite the gap uh, in, in from theory to practice. And I think that's the fundamental uh, opportunity here. Um, people believe they should be, but don't know how or have not chosen to. And so specifically to your question about why is uh, KM not advanced and why have they become separate enablers? Um, the most common answer on that is that people will say there's no ICHQ guideline like QRM benefits from Q9, but there's no Q guideline for uh, knowledge management. And, and that's certainly true. Um, but if you kind of double click on that, if you ask why to that, why is there no quality guideline? Uh, there's a couple observations I'd love to share, uh, four observations. Number one, um, if you look at the evolution of the practice in our industry, QRM is embedded in a quality management system based on the GMPs, but KM is not. So there's a kind of a gap in requirement setting there, although KM is called out in both ICHQ10 and ISO 9001. Uh, secondly, KM simply hasn't been around as long. Risk management has a history of over 70 years and KM of only 30 years, so KM is still maturing as a practice. Um, thirdly, there is a very rich um, existing body of literature and many standards on risk management. Um, looking at Q9 itself, there are 10 ISO or IEC standards for risk management. Um, and um, ISO did not publish its first KM document until 2018. Um, and lastly, and I think this might be a, one of the root issues here too, is that QRM, in my opinion anyways, is a bit more discrete, confined, contained, and can be better characterized by no means to say it's simple. Um, whereas KM is more diverse and subjective. And if you look at the best practices from other industries, it often depends on org organizational challenges or business models or some tacit knowledge, some explicit knowledge. So figuring out what you wanna do is, is more of a challenge. So those are my opinions. Sure, no, and that makes total sense. Nula, you know, as a staff member of TU Dublin, um, as well as being involved with some of Marty's research, while also working in industry, um, what are your thoughts on how these two disciplines became separated? Yeah, and you know, I mean, this is really a, a key area of uh, a focus for, for the research group as a whole, and, and Marty has advanced um, uh, the thinking in this in the work that he's done, but it is very rooted in practitioner um, basis. We're, we're definitely um, uh, within TU Dublin, the group that we, we, we do the research through the pharmaceutical regulatory science team, we're all working in industry, and we're all trying to solve problems at a practitioner level. Uh, this isn't ivory tower um, research by by any manner or means. So in terms of this, you know, yeah, QRM evolved faster. And as Marty said, you know, it hasn't been around longer. And yes, it got a Q9, it got a Q document. So that definitely pegged it as something that people, you know, when, you know, oh, there's a Q9 and there's all the tools and that's the annex and that's how we go about doing it. But in my experience, um, uh, you know, as a practitioner in this area, even though QRM may have been around longer and there is plenty of evidence, uh, not least of all our panels, uh, guests who've been on this show with us pr previously, um, that underlines that we are still struggling to embed risk within the everyday workflows. Um, uh, and even QRM is still often viewed as a sidebar activity. You know, it's something that has to be done as part of the validation file and, you know, compliance check. Yeah, we need to do a risk assessment. We've just had an investigation, so we need to have a risk assessment on file. And it very often ends up being out there in a sidebar. And the work that we're certainly trying to do now and the work that I do through the Quality Risk Management Institute is about bringing that into the central workflows that everybody's job in a GMP environment is about managing risk and reducing that risk and being preventative about risk every day. Um, um, as regards managing our knowledge, again, for many years, the industry has had an emphasis on document and record management, you know, being audit or inspection ready was our highest aspiration. Um, uh, so we went from, you know, the old paper archives with the document controllers 
um, to electronic systems, you know, such as Trackwise or Documentum or more recently the Viva systems. And of course, that has led us down the path to managing those electronic records, which kicked in the whole 21 CFR Part 11 and Annex 11 in, in Europe. And that then on the tail of that, we have the Halley's Comet, that is the data integrity problems that have come with managing electronic records and um, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so much of the energy and resources within the industry has been expended on keeping that record management gig straight. We lost sight of what was contained inside those records, you know, what was written down in them, which is, of course, um, uh, the, our organizational lifeblood, our knowledge. Um, so the need to manage what we know is there um, in order to inform what we do. We need to know what's on those records, not just that we are able to present that record if an inspector comes in and says, "Where you know, where's the batch record for um, X batch um, from last year? So this is um, a, a paradigm shift that, that has been happening within the industry of recognition that we need to manage what we know in order to be able to inform ourselves to make these good risk-based decisions. Um, and now it's being starting to be emerge as a mainstream discipline just starting companies like Merck have been leading the 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 pathway um, spearheading this for our industry and you know folks like Marcy and many of his colleagues are you know speak routinely at international conferences and Marcy and and, and Paige Kane one of our uh, other research colleagues but also in Merck have led the production of an ISPE um, uh, 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 baseline or a, gu a good practice guide on KM so we're only really starting to see um, this emerge as a mainstream um, uh, discipline in its own right with resources um, to go that with that. And, and, you know, some of the other drivers that have influenced this are, you know, the advent of ICHQ12, that where, the, you know, we, we finally found a diagram with knowledge right in the center of, the, of that diagram and the recognition that you need to manage your knowledge in order to justify any post-approval change. So to manage your change effectively, you need to manage that knowledge. Um, but also, you know, in more recent years, we've seen this huge fragmentation in the industry, whether that's through mergers and acquisitions where, you know, portfolios are moving around and companies are buying other organizations. And that, where does that knowledge go when that M&A event happens? Um, but also the huge proliferation in um, uh, the, you know, external supply chains um, and uh, the, the um, uh, perhaps over um, uh, emphasis on, on, on use of external suppliers. And of course, what happens there is you can have very negative impacts and high costs when you get when you get a hit and you realize that was because we weren't managing our external knowledge we were managing our external supply chain but we weren't thinking about renting you know we were renting services but we weren't thinking about where does our knowledge go when we rent those services uh, of our products and of course we have the typical knowledge leakage which i know that marty's going to talk about later on that happens through those diverse chains but also we have also started, you know, to see huge technological advances, you know, in the whole area of data analytics and big data and search capabilities. So there are technology platforms now that can enable organizations to be better at managing what they know and getting access to that beyond a small cohort of folks who traditionally had had um, had access. So some of those are the reasons why they, you know, it, it they emerged and, and kind of maintained as separate entities. Um, but as Marty says, they're very interdependent and people do recognize theoretically that they are interdependent or it need to be integrated. Um, but we're, we're really only we're really early in the journey of, of that at the moment. Thank you, Nula. I, you know, I'm just listening to both of you talk and obviously I am not um, in the same sphere with you. I don't research this topic, but in listening, it's, you know, a couple things occurred to me that um, knowledge management may not have initially gotten all the, the same recognition that QRM did because we took our, we take our knowledge for granted, or at least maybe 30 or 40 years ago we did because you know, we kept our staff around a lot longer. People were there. You didn't lose that knowledge necessarily, um, you know, and at least you could plan for it if someone was going to retire. But now, um, to, to your point, you know, there have been mergers and acquisitions. There are people who are leaving um, the company much more readily than they were maybe 30 or 40 years ago. And um, this makes 
the practice of keeping your knowledge, managing your knowledge that much more important now so that you don't lose that history, you don't lose that um, combined knowledge, you know, that these people bring. So I, I think this is just such a fascinating topic, but also such a necessary conversation. So, you know, with that being said, Marty, I know you went through a process um, to develop this integration of KM and QRM. Um, and you've developed some graphics too. How did you come to the realization that the two needed to be integrated? And if you could, for our listeners, describe the genesis of the QRM KM infinity loop or the Lipa loop as Lula <laughs> likes to refer to it. <laughs> I still blush when I hear that. Um, thanks, Stacey. Um, and you're spot on with some of your comments earlier about the rate of change in the industry and stuff. So definitely agree with that. Um, so um, um, I'm gonna kind of help try to do best I can to help you verbally visualize what we're talking about with this RKI cycle. And before I do that, I just want to acknowledge um, uh, not just Nula as one of my co-supervisors and Ann Green, but also Kevin O'Donnell, Dr. Kevin O'Donnell of the HPRA, who was co-author. And Kevin's the, the rapporteur of ICHQ9 revision. Uh, and so as we try to influence QRM and KM together, what a fantastic opportunity to inject some of that thinking into the QRM thinking. So I want to call that out and acknowledge Kevin. So um, thinking about this uh, for a moment, put your uh, kind of uh, your artistic hat on for a moment. If you can picture a, an infinity uh, symbol, and on the far left you have this uh, this uh, uh, QRM process, how we manage risk via QRM, and on the far right you have how we manage knowledge via KM. And uh, in between there are multiple stops that connect the two uh, in a very seamless, um, boundaryless fashion. And so those concepts are. Um, as you come into risk management, that you have knowledge input, such as the best available knowledge of the organization, the explicit knowledge of, of prior knowledge, platform knowledge, uh, expertise, uh, lessons learned, and so on, as well as just the core technical uh, knowledge that we have from development and, and uh, troubleshooting and changes and so on. And then leaving, and then you do your risk, risk assessment, and one of the primary um, uh, outputs of risk management is knowledge. It's right. It's a series of decisions and there's rationale behind those decisions. There are risk controls put in place. One would say a knowledge input into that is even how did risk controls perform in the past. Do you now know things where that are risks, i.e. they may be known unknowns. You know that you don't know what will happen if that batch ages longer than the hold time, for example, and you may choose to accept that risk or to study further, what have you. So that's the risk half of the diagram. And then uh, that knowledge flows in and can be managed by knowledge management, as well as the other knowledge that is routinely uh, acquired through, through plan development work and on an exception basis through uh, deviations and investigations and what have you, um, managed through a series of KM practices, uh, and then ultimately made available um, uh, through uh, being visible and available to people that need it uh, to support continual improvement. And so that's really the, the loop. And then it repeats um, uh, into making that knowledge available for the next QRM process. And so some features of that loop, um, some principles, if you will, is that, um, and I explained this in some of the, the background articles that, that we'll provide afterwards, but there's an inverse relationship between knowledge and risk. Um, the more you know, um, the greater your understanding, the lower your uncertainty, and therefore the, you have an opportunity to, to lower your risk. Um, as I mentioned, knowledge is an input to and an output from risk management, which is really an important concept. And if you read the quality guidelines, you'll see that. Um, uh, I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Um, this concept of flow, that knowledge is flowing in and out of QRM, um, that it's, this cycle is always on. The more you learn, the more you should always be ready to uh, mi mitigate, um, understand your risk profile and act as appropriate. Um, and, and it's also importantly, QRM and KM, notice the word we've used here, integrated, but not um, unified. And so they're not meant to be the same thing, but they are symbiotic in terms of accomplishing their respective missions. So I want to uh, emphasize that in point as well. So, so in terms of the genesis, that's the, that's the model that we're talking about. And um, as with anything the PRST does, it really uh, ends, begins with the patient in mind and, and ask yourself, what would they expect? And so, and through my research, practically speaking, it started on tech transfer. Uh, and through my tech transfer research, I realized that there was a fundamental disconnect where how are knowledge transfer risks assessed? What's the evidence that we're doing that? Uh, and a variety of other uh, inputs. And then secondly, this was a, there was a very strong uh, signal here as well as myself being a KM practitioner for over a decade, it's been evident that QRM is more in the spotlight. And we talked about some of those reasons earlier, but if you look at conference agendas and presentations and guidance documents and so on, 
how many QRM presentations invoke uh, requiring knowledge management? Not very many, I would say anecdotally 10% or less. They do manage in knowledge sometimes, but not knowledge management. And so, um, you know, as my boss says, um, uh, managing knowledge is good business. Of course, managing risk is good business. And so therefore it seems rather elementary, I would argue, that should you not apply the best that you know as a company to maximize your risk reduction. And what would, and that's the fundamental job of KM is to make knowledge of the organization available and visible. And if you're a patient awaiting a life saving therapy to be on the market or a drug shortage, God forbid, would you expect any different of the organization to uh, seamlessly apply the best of it knows? I, I certainly wouldn't as a, as a consumer. And, and lastly, I'll say, you know, that's been validated as a hunch, but then validated through a number of, uh, of surveys, as I mentioned, mentioned earlier. So, um, so that's, that's the genesis and hopefully that, uh, that visual representation uh, verbalized is helpful. Thank you, Marty. So Nula, let's talk about risk-based decision-making and how this QRM, KM gap has actually led to a gap in decision-making as well. And why is this happening? And where does KM feed into the decision-making process? Yeah, yeah. And, and that is the, the bottom line. It's about uh, these risk based decisions. I mean, there's a whole host of reasons, um, good business reasons, as Marty said, that you would want, want to manage your knowledge. But ultimately, when you're in that position of having to make a risk based decision, whether it's in that um, uh, deep dive that Marty did in tech transfer, because you've got a new product introduction coming in, or you're moving it into another site in the network or uh, external network, um, uh, you, uh, what it comes down to is an expectation that you're able to justify your risk-based decision making um, and that and that though you know that, that what's good for the patient is good for the business and that and that you're you're using that to inform your decision making. So but you can't make good risk-based decisions without good KM without good knowledge. Um, and, and this is what has happened over the years is, you know, sound science and good data are, are prerequisites to an effective risk-based decision making. But, but that requires good habits around knowledge seeking and knowledge sharing. And, you know, these are when, when Marty refers to these KM practices, it is around how do you build in knowledge seeking practices and knowledge sharing practices into the daily workflows. Um, so that you you know there is an expectation that you're able to justify your answers um, and that you know you or your recommendations um, that you're putting forward to leadership with hard facts and good data. Um, uh, and very often that's not the case. You know, we have um, evangelized in our industry, the SMEs. Now I know we've, we've spoken before and, and in fact in, 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 um, in, in Merck certainly, um, they have a phrase where they, where they call them knowledge stewards. And, and that is my belief that we should be talking about our subject matter experts as knowledge stewards so that they don't become hoarders of knowledge, they become sharers of knowledge and it's part of their, of their expectation. But you know, when we've, when we've evangelized these SMEs um, or, or even experienced leaders, who are typically responsible for that formal decision-making process. Um, very often they're basing their decisions on subjective opinion, you know, and there isn't an expectation that they're backing that up with hard facts and good data. Um, uh, and in fact, sometimes people might make recommendations based on the hard facts and good data, and then they'll say, yeah, but we're not, we're not accepting that. We're going to do something different anyway. Um, so we all accept that risk is all about managing uncertainty. I mean, if, if things were certain, if something was going to happen every Thursday at three o'clock, it wouldn't be a risk. So risk management is all about managing levels of uncertainty. And if we seek to do this through subjective opinion, we're compounding that risk potentially rather than reducing that risk. Because by introducing a subjective opinion rather than knowledge and, and good facts, and hard, hard, you know, good hard facts and good data, you're potentially um, uh, uh, actually adding a, a further amount of uncertainty into that, into that risk event. And so that, that kind of brings us back to this managing what we know. Um, uh, and, and I like to talk about it in those terms, because when we talk about knowledge management, people think, oh, it's a computer system or it's a, you know, it's a it's, it's a process over there. 
it's about managing what we know every day, every every role in the business, managing what we know. And we have to stop accepting, um, and I, you know, I don't want to completely ding all our, all our SMEs. They're very valuable, our technical experts. But we've st- got to stop accepting that kind of subjective um, uh, uh, opinion as gospel in terms of what we know. And because there's also many things that are known by the frontline personnel who don't have a stripe on their shoulder as an SME or a technical expert. Um, And we don't often have routine practices that enable that voice to step forward with potential information or knowledge um, when we're considering uh, a given um, risk event. So we've got to get to the place where everyone in the business, you know, understands that the golden rule is that if they're asked what is the probability of X event happening, they're not being asked for an opinion. They're being asked for an answer that's based on hard facts and good data. And and we don't have, if they don't have it to hand, they've also got to know that the second golden rule is it's okay to say, I don't know. Um, They don't have to guess. Um, This isn't about a guesstimate. We want them to go and knowledge seek and access information as best they can to support that decision. Um, uh, so that they can respond accurately um, uh, and in a timely manner to a query. And it's about making sure that those good habits support that knowledge seeking and knowledge sharing and an expectation that you don't just rumble into a meeting and put your finger in the air and say, oh, yeah, I think we're okay. That's a three or it's a medium risk or whatever. You you back it up with, with good knowledge. And therefore, that builds the need for building that continuous knowledge that uh, Marty talked about as we, uh, you know, for every batch, every 10 batches, every 100 batches, we now have more knowledge about that product um, than we had when we started out um, at the very beginning. Um, so, you know, that for me is is the essence of, you know, ensuring that we we start to have that pull from the business for that knowledge um, when we accept that risk based decisions are not made on base on the basis of subjective opinion. You know, yeah, some really great points there, Nula, um, for sure. Um, some considerations for our listeners. Um, I want to talk a little bit more. You, you briefly mentioned. Um, formal, like formal processes. And uh, Marty, I know you actually worked on an article with Dr. O'Donnell, um, understanding the concept of formality in quality risk management uh, systems. So I want to dig in a little bit more on that and ask you what you see as KM and QRM uh, in the formal sense. And are we too formal in how we're interpreting industry documents referencing these uh, practices. Yeah, I think, uh, <clears throat> interestingly, we're, we're pr- probably formal and we're probably too literal. Uh, so what I mean by that is that if you review, <clears throat> excuse me for a moment, if you review the ICH quality documents as well as several other documents by the WHO and other regulatory agencies, And if you look beyond the words of risk management, of quality risk management, and of knowledge management, you'll actually find um, a lot of references to managing knowledge and managing risk that aren't, or or decisions should be based on the best scientific knowledge, words like that, where it's not in flashing red letters, do KM and do QRM, but that's what they're asking us to do in those documents. And not just that, but there's another set of clues that gets into what we in KM practice would call tacit knowledge. tacit knowledge is what we think about as uh, decision rationale, uh, learning from history, experience, expertise, um, access to who knows simply as an example of tacit knowledge. And, and um, it's been well characterized that 70 to 80% of what we know as an organization is tacit knowledge. Hence why we even have an SME in the room um, to, to start that dialogue and assess risk. So I think looking past the surface is really important to understand the kind of the intent, the spirit of what, we're, what we as industry are, are asked to do or expected to do in those guidelines. So that was a key insight uh, for me. I will also share from a KM perspective, and, and listen, Nula has shared a little bit more on some of those practices and what we mean by those practices. And we could spend a whole series of podcasts on that. Um, <clears throat> but this is not a KM podcast, but there's certainly more learning opportunities there uh, as well. But um, other industries, we as we in biopharma are in general behind in knowledge management, many other industries. Um, <clears throat> and there are several cases in the literature, and, and this is in the article that, that Stacy mentioned that we'll share, where KM and QRM are actually co-deployed or integrated because they 
they tailor a knowledge management program to make sure they manage the risk. And that, again, is the fundamental gap that we're talking about today, that, that we probably haven't done the best job that we can in that, um, at least uh, in any broad sense in, this, in our industry. And so also to, to link to what Nula said, um, I've actually told some of our very senior leaders, it's, it's not about knowledge management. I don't care if you call it knowledge management, figuratively, it's about managing knowledge. Right. Um, <clears throat> so we want, when I ask people, um, whose job is it to do knowledge management? I get these funny blank stares and they're looking at me like you, it's in your job description and your title. But then I say, whose job is it to manage knowledge? And the room kind of goes quiet. And I'm like, of course, it's all of you and, and how you do your work. And, and that's seen as a how in our organization, how work can be done more effectively and, and done smarter. And ultimately what we're trying to do, and Nula led, uh, alluded to this as well, is to get people to see that knowledge of the organization, as well as certainly how to recognize and um, predict and manage risk, our core mindsets like safety or quality, right? It's not just the job of people and safety to make sure that you're safe, right? Um, likewise, in, in, in managing knowledge and managing risk, that's an element of, of everybody's job and everybody's responsibility every day. Right. I, I, I would definitely agree. Um, that's all, you know, it, it, it's related to this whole shift culture shift that we're that we're looking for uh, within organizations to make everyone accountable not only for the knowledge but um, for reducing risk for um, boosting patient safety all of those things uh, that you can't point to one person and say it's your responsibility because really it's responsibility of the entire team so um, I love that um, you referenced that here so Marty um, there are a series of disruptors in the industry. For example, the pandemic, which we just cannot seem to get out from under, <laughs> you know, that drive the use of data to make lots of important critical decisions. And knowledge management will need to be adopted faster to respond to these types of, you know, emergent disruptors. So what's your advice, being that you have spent more than a decade um, thinking about this, what's your advice to have a steeper acceptance and adoption of KM, unlike the slow uptake that QRM has faced uh, in the industry? Yeah, great question, Stacey. And I'll say, just to even paint that picture more um, specifically, as an industry, we, we had already been facing um, a more competitive landscape, a lot more of external networks and more tech transfers and more startups that would, would, would uh, you know, discover a molecule then, and throw it over the fence, more complex products. Think about ATMPs, for example. And now COVID has come along and there's this incredible need um, for speed with vaccine development. Um, and I will mention, I guess, in passing, just to further validate what we're talking about here is I, I had the privilege of getting a call from the Moderna folks just before the pandemic was called a pandemic and asked for a bit of advice and, and um, had a KM conversation um, and then got a call back later in the year saying that, hey, it was really helpful for them to file their product, right? Which was a tremendous success story for just some of the basics in KM. And now as we're coming, you know, where we are in the pandemic, I won't say coming out of it yet. Um, you've got geopolitical changes that are driving changes to supply chains, geopolitical forces driving changes to supply chains, uh, onshoring, reshoring um, uh, activities, uh, accelerated development will be a kind of a core expectation going forward, new technology that will be introduced to make sure uh, that we can produce things in a more cost-effective, reliable uh, fashion like continuous manufacturing. And even on a previous episode of the series, uh, Tiff Baker had shared that um, for, for a development of a COVID related product um, that, that on a daily basis, risk assessments were being done based on the latest available knowledge. And that was music to my ears. And that's the very spirit of that RKI cycle being continuous and perpetual uh, and making sure that knowledge is available. So, so I think that the advice is, is relatively straightforward. Maybe, uh, you know, if anything, it's the, the things that haunt other uh, changes in organizations. Um, uh, change, getting people to think a little bit differently is very fundamental um, to, to getting people to recognize that knowledge is an asset. Um, while it's everyone's job, you also need some specialists. Like in my role, I lead a very small team in the, in the grand scheme of 20,000 plus people in manufacturing to have a, a, a group of 10 people, but we're the, the specialists in, in understanding what knowledge management is and the process owners. We own the standards and train people, answer questions, do continuous improvement, et cetera. Um, um, I would encourage people to take some time to learn from other industries, um, other industries, um, consulting, uh, where knowledge is their business, aerospace, uh, energy industries are, are more advanced in general than, 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 than biopharmaceuticals are. Um, 
a really important best practice is to align with business needs. So, so not just saying we're going to do knowledge management as a housekeeping exercise, but link it to better risk outcomes in our case of our conversation today. Um, but we've also seen benefits in, in um, reducing waste and making people more efficient in their jobs, making better decisions, even if they're not specifically risk-based decisions in the QRM process. We've seen benefits in employee engagement, reducing time to competency, reduction in problem solving time. So there's a lot of other benefits as well. So being able to tie what you're doing to a business outcome of, of that's applicable is very, very important. Um, measure what you do to show the impact and the results and, and don't wait for perfect, just get started. Um, there's some very simple things. Everybody, I would argue everyone's doing KM now, just not very intentionally and probably not very very well in many cases. And so understand what you're doing and, and, and seek to improve it um, would be a key item as well. Thanks, Marty. I mean, as you paint this picture, it's really easy to see um, how important knowledge management, managing your collective knowledge is to almost every aspect of your business. Um, you know, so uh, Nula, I also want to get your thoughts on the same topic. Um, how can we drive a steeper acceptance of KM practices and improving our business? Yeah, and you know, I'm really going to pick up on what Marty said there, because it really is about operationalizing this um, into the everyday. Um, and, um, and it's not waiting for perfect. You know, I think Marty uses the phrase, I think you've got this piece of advice when you were out um, on, on the road, um, start, start small, but start. Um, so that's the first thing to get a steeper um, acceleration is actually do something, get started, and be purposeful about it. And, and the other thing for me, you know, one of the other major things, Marty mentioned tacit knowledge, that's the know-how in people's heads. And in fact, you know, whether it's 70, 30 or 80, 20, but largely speaking, there's an acknowledgement that even within our industry where we have this complete, um, you know, passion for paper, um, we only, you know, all, what's written down is only about 20 or 30 percent of what's our organizational knowledge. 70 or 80 percent of what is known in the business is inside the heads of our, our colleagues. And that's the piece that we have to get flowing. So a steeper acceptance um, is about getting that dialogue, getting people talking, you know, enabling that communication pathway of getting that knowledge to flow, because that tacit knowledge, that know-how can only flow through dialogue. It doesn't, we don't have, you know, telekinesis or whatever at the moment. So we've got to have a dialogue. We've got to get your teams together and get them cross-functionally together. And, and as part of that, we've got to embed and reward curiosity. Now, um, you know, Laurie and I have spoken about risk being risk curious we really want to um, uh, reward and build into our cultures like you mentioned Stacy this concept of curiosity don't accept everything as you know right first time on the paper um, uh, uh, ask questions speak up surface issues why is this this way or why do we do it that way or I noticed something yesterday and it wasn't quite what I expected that's the way that we can get some of this knowledge uh, to flow um, and there may well be a very good reason why we do something that way. But very often it turns out that that's because the way we've always done it rather than being really, you know, grounded in a, in a, um, a good justification. So we want to reward purposefully reward knowledge sharing and knowledge seeking and link that into our um, our values and behaviors and link it into our organizational reward and recognition systems. So whether that's proactive risk reduction or whether it's knowledge seeking and knowledge sharing, if somebody does uh, an act of kindness by, by um, uh, sharing some of their knowledge or managing what they know, um, that should be rewarded. They should get a peer recognition based on that behavior and, um, and make that you know, visible um, as an attractive um, uh, trait for, for somebody to aspire towards. The other way, and, and Marty knows well about this, you know, build virtual communities or communities of practice, get people in like-minded areas, whether that's new product introductions, whether it's aseptic techniques, whether, you know, whatever those hot topics are for your business, get that knowledge to flow across your network. Don't keep it just within individual sites because the agency doesn't expect that you retain your knowledge within individual sites. If they ding you at one site, they expect you to have fixed that problem at the next site in your network. So make sure your pathways are not just, you know, inside the fence that they, they, they go, you know, outwards through the network. And it's amazing. Um, I know Marty has some great um, case studies. 
where they've reduced, you know, um, issues where breakdowns have happened. One other site in the network was able to row in very quickly with a spare part and the knowledge and the expertise to do that. And, and they were back up and running. So by getting these pathways um, of knowledge sharing through these virtual communities, um, you're building relationships. Building relationships builds a pathway for knowledge to flow. The other thing then is, um, uh, you know, we did talk about the technology that's available. Um, but very often we have a very elitist um, uh, approach to how we implement some of these technologies. So, um, you know, we have a situation where we, we have some data banks or, you know, uh, reporting um, processes, whether it's Pi or something like that, that you can, you can survey the data that's there, but only a handful of people are allowed to have that access. And now you have to go through the gatekeeper to say, oh, I'm interested in looking at this data point over, over a particular period. So, you know, um, be much more um, uh, uh, agnostic about who, who can have access to read only. I mean, we don't want them tampering with data, but read only. They should be able to have access um, to that data and making that uh, uh, access to that knowledge more available helps when you're asking people, don't turn up here without good knowledge. I mean, Deming said, says, you know, in, um, uh, in God we trust, everyone else needs to bring data. So, um, so, but they can't bring data if they don't have um, access to that data system. And, and the other, you know, sometimes the technology is actually a Guinness when, when it comes to this, you know, um, it creates the, the, the barriers. You know, SharePoint is, is a case in point. It's a fantastic um, resource when used well but it can actually end up with organizational locked in syndrome because if you're not a member of that team you don't you don't see what's in that repository you know and you may not you may not be able to access it unless it's set up in a way that that enables that that search um uh, to happen so these are all things setting up standard work practices um so that good you know good data and hard facts are are, are part of that and structured problem solving a3 improvement projects you know all of these practices are ways in which we can um channel and harvest data you know through our kaizen improve continuous improvement projects so make sure that's getting fed back into the mothership and it's not like locked in in some little little pocket of excellence somewhere um, crowdsource that knowledge sharing. So rotate lunch and learns through different functions. Um, make it, you know, part of, you know, employee development plans that they have to step up and share something on, on a topic of interest for them um, uh, or write a small article for the intranet or whatever. And again, reward and recognize when they step forward to do that. Put it in their um, uh, learning development plan that they need to do two of these events a year. And, you know, they will enjoy it so much, but it's so valuable for them to get up and, and share that. So build that learning organization create that culture of learning and value that is a, is a way we can we can and make it tactical you know just do it just start with something small a couple of lunch and learns and and hand them out pass out the cards and say okay you're doing you're doing february's lunch and learn um and 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 th this is the way at a at a crowdsourcing level we can start at a you do need that top-down approach that systematic approach that um, uh, Marty is talking about of having, you know, a program and having people who are, you know, establishing a strategy. But there's also a bottom up part to this of actually getting it contagious on the ground, you know. Thank you, Nula. I mean, some great tips right there uh, for really uh, beginning the conversations and starting to promote, you know, knowledge share within um, teams. I think that's great. Um, Marty, I, I just, you know, I'm sitting here thinking about, you know, right at the beginning, you said that knowledge management um, has only been around for a few decades as, as opposed to QRM. And so I'm just wondering, you know, being in your position as uh, a director of knowledge management, do you think that you would have gotten to this point of understanding and influence as a practitioner organically? Um, or do you really think, because I know you spent a lot of time researching um, academic research uh, as you pursued your PhD on these very same topics. Um, so do you think it was necessary, the education and academic work um, to engage with others and building this understanding for you? Or do you, know, do, do you think that you would have arrived there anyway? 
Yeah, no, that's a neat question. And and, I'll, and before I answer that, I want to make a really quick comment on the conversation we've been having around behaviors and knowledge seeking and knowledge sharing. And and, and I'm mindful we don't want to, you people already have so many things to do, right? We already have safety mindsets and behaviors. We got quality mindsets and behaviors. We got DNI mindsets and behaviors and whatever your other culture is, digital mindsets and behaviors. And so, so you know, I haven't quite cracked how to do this in a very concise fashion yet, but fundamentally, if you think about some of the overarching concepts and, and learning organizations, a little bit of a buzzword, but having a growth mindset, being curious, being agile. And if you just for 10 seconds, ask yourself, if you were CEO of your organization and you had the choice between people in your organization resolving an old problem and taking an extra three months to do it while the product is out of stock or, um, or uh, same with development, not leveraging prior knowledge, would that be okay? And I hope you agree with me. The answer typically would be no. Uh, and that's the whole premise of, of KM and those mindsets. It's not, again, KM, it's managing knowledge. And so that, that's, a, that's a really important uh, thought model. Um, Stacy, your question on the academic opportunity. You know, I think I've always approached this from a, a very kind of a deep thinking perspective, a detail oriented person, done a lot of benchmarking and reading. So I think that some of the fundamentals of KM are things that I had learned, but almost through an academic approach on the job over, over the last decade. Um, specific to this opportunity though, absolutely um, the opportunity to understand and influence on the global stage, not how to do KM, but how KM fits into the regulatory framework, the relationship between KM and QRM and establishing KM standards like Nula mentioned, the ISP good practice guide on KM are, are some great examples of that. And I think, you know, for me personally, um, I had a fairly good network um, and that's actually how I met Nula once upon a time in the context of, uh, of doing knowledge management, but to kind of um, free, free the chains, shed the constraints of my day job and being able to engage um, with uh, regulators, with other companies. So being able to, with other academia, being able to do that on a kind of a functional basis, if you will, but also on a global basis um, across uh, different regions of the world and different regulatory bodies has been a tremendously uh, rewarding and insightful uh, opportunity for me. So I, I wouldn't trade that for anything. And I feel like it's, I've learned personally and, and hopefully the outputs of my work um, benefit the industry. And, and I do believe, um, not to shamelessly self-plug the, the pharmaceutical regulatory science team, but I think the work um, has really um, positively impacted industry guidance. And that dates back to some of Nula's work that um, uh, the Q12 rapporteur said, um, you know, we're leaving here um, with a different understanding of what KM is back in 2015 at a conference that Nula organized. Um, the work that I've done is being fed into the Q9 team and, and some of the feedback on the ISP guide is that this could be the basis for a possible ICH guidance on KM. And so that wouldn't happen otherwise without that capacity and that influence and those linkages. So I, um, I, I do uh, think it's been a tremendous opportunity and, and, and uh, helped a lot. Excellent. Well, whatever the, uh, whatever the impetus was, here you are. <laughs> and here we are as an industry, uh, much better for understanding uh, are beginning to understand just how impactful uh, knowledge management is to us as an industry um, and within our own organizations. So, you know, as we get ready to wrap up today, I just want to, um, you know, give you opportunities, both of you, to share your closing thoughts um, on all that we've discussed around QRM and KM and the need for those two things to work together. Uh, and Marty, we'll start with you. Sure. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I hope, um, encourage the, the listeners to, to look at the article and, and see that visualization that I tried to paint for you and understanding the cycle between the two. And it's really meant to be um, both a thought model and a process model to get people to think a little bit differently uh, about how those two are related. And, and in the, in the um, the materials that will provide uh, a survey really provided some fantastically supportive feedback of, of how, um, yes, it's obvious we should be doing that. We're just not good at it. And several other comments that really, that really highlight uh, that people know this is an issue. They just don't really know what to do about it. And so to that end, um, um, I'm working with some of my colleagues on developing some case studies and, and something of an application guide, a user guide, implementation guide, whatever we call it, for the RKI cycle to, to make it more real and tangible. Um, so that's number one. Um, watch for that if it's of interest to you. Um, secondly, I would, would hope 
that each of you leaving here and hearing a couple of these KM first principles on the concepts of tacit knowledge and knowledge flow and leveraging knowledge as an asset and knowledge seeking and sharing as, as positive behaviors is that um, uh, folks can better understand and recognize knowledge flow issues, recognize the waste associated with that, whether it's not finding the knowledge or a suboptimal decision because you didn't find it when you needed it. Uh, and know that knowledge management is a thing, it's a practice um, that you can learn more about. You know, and, and our theme of this, um, of this webcast to infinity and beyond, that, that's kind of a playful title that characterizes the very spirit of what we're trying to do in, in, in making that relationship between QRM and KM um, continuous and perpetual. And I think that's really kind of embodies the, the, the essence of this. And, you know, given, I would argue, given the complexities that I talked about earlier that we face as a society, you know, there's never been a, a, a time before that it's been more important to manage knowledge and risk. And as Nula pointed out earlier, my final comment is think big, start small, but start. Yeah. Love it. Nula. Yeah, and look, um, um, Marcy, you, you, thank you, first of all, for uh, such a great um, uh, run through on the on the work that you do. Um, and, uh, you know, you've mentioned so many things and we'll come back to some of the things that we're sharing in our um, uh, in our uh, takeaways. But for me, again, it is really, uh, the, you know, the, the, the takeaway for this is even though it's a, a less mature um, discipline in the industry, Get out there and um, uh, and and network across the industry. You know, go and visit your colleagues in in their organizations and see what they're doing. Um, uh, benchmark against um, uh, other organizations and even organizations that are not in the biopharma industry. Um, APQC has a great um, uh, program uh, around that, around knowledge management, and that's certainly where Marty would have um, been a go-to place in the early days. Marty and I met um, in many years ago at a PDA conference around knowledge that was organized uh, with um, Ed Hoffman, who was then the chief knowledge officer from NASA. Um, uh, we've worked together now on this ISPE um, good practice guide, um, uh, which is another. And so there's a there's a community of practice there on that. And of course, I have to give a shout out to JBT because certainly on the academic um, uh, front, a lot of the work that PRST gets to publish, whether that's, you know, in, in articles or, or through conference papers, um, JBT provides us with a fantastic platform, not to mention the fact that we have this, this fa fabulous podcast opportunity with you as well. Um, uh, so it, networking through the JBT network, networking through the other industry associations, get out and inform yourself. Um, and um, uh, and that's you know one of the key ways I would say. But I, I'm not wanting to plug a particular document. Um, and we're going to give away lots of free things as part of this. But one you will have to um, uh, put your card um, on the line for is I would really recommend as a as a as a starter kit is that knowledge uh, management uh, good practice guide that we've worked together on uh, for for ISPE. Um, and uh, there's a whole host of really good um, uh, case studies and various different practices um, that have been shared in that. So that's a great place to start. And it's, uh, you know, not, it's not it's not a huge hit to put the hand in the pocket for that. Um, but in terms of our takeaways for our listeners today, we've got our JVT articles. I think we've got two articles that Marty has been involved in, um, uh, including the LIPA loop or the ORCAI um, uh, loop. Um, and um, uh, there's, uh, you know, several other, I think you've also linked to your survey, Marty, we pro will provide that link um, to the survey through the TU Dublin Arrow um, uh, site as well. So some interesting, you know, even the visualization of some of those, um, uh, some of those data points around what the industry is, is saying of where we are, or where we need to be, they can be useful if you're having a dialogue with your leaders about, look, this, this is where the industry is. We need to get on the bus. We need to buy a ticket for this. Um, so that's, you know, that's where I'm at. But thank you, um, Marty, for, for joining us today and for, for sharing us. And, and thank you, Stacey, for um, uh, taking your hand on to the tiller for the, for the, <laughs> to drive the, drive the boat today. Yeah, well, no, I mean, I have thanks for you. Thanks to uh, both you and Lori, uh, Lori and Nula, of course, for putting together such a great episode. Um, and of course, Marty, uh, for being here with us today and sharing your expertise around the hows and whys of knowledge management. I think it's a really important discussion. I also want to give a shout out to our producer, Ben Kitchen, and most importantly, thanks and appreciation to you, our valued listeners. 
I'm grateful for your time each week and for your help in sharing this podcast. Together, we'll keep spreading the good word. As always, if you enjoyed today's episode, please remember to subscribe in your podcast player of choice and share it with your friends, colleagues, and online networks so they can enjoy it too. Plus, send us a quick note or leave an online review. We love reading your comments and suggestions. For show notes and additional podcast resources, including all the lovely takeaways that we uh, talked about throughout this episode, please visit www.ibetnetwork.com backslash podcast. We'll be back again next week with another lively and insightful discussion. Until then, make it a great week.